Oh, thank you. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here, and I've asked myself that same question, what am I doing here? I, uh, I'm a trained physicist. Uh, I moved to chemical engineering, and I thought that was a big change. So to be here and to be uh, in the presence of such talented neuroscientists is really, uh, really a treat for me, and it really helps contextualize some of the work that I have done in the past, and more importantly, it helps contextualize the work that I want to do in the future. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is a, a new technology that we've been developing uh, in collaboration with several groups, um, and one that I continue uh, as I transition to a faculty position at UC Berkeley. Um, and so I'm going to start out with a picture of my sister. Uh, this is my younger sister, Allie. And you can tell just by looking at her that she's happy, right? So that's the, uh, that's the behavior part. Um, and the reason she's happy is because she's about to dig into a tub of ice cream. And so you can see the anticipation in her face, right? This is the behavior part of what we see when we are stimulated by our environment. Now, of course, as we've learned today, uh, people who suffer from mental disorders, schizophrenia, uh, depression, addictive behaviors, uh, might have abnormal ways of, of presenting this behavior, but of course, that originates on a molecular scale in the brain, right? So if I wanted to see how my sister was responding to this anticipatory treat, I would want to look into her brain, right? But there are many things that are preventing me from doing that. Uh, so what I wanted to do was develop a tool that had these characteristics that would enable me to, in theory, be able to look at how my sister's brain is reacting to ice cream. So the tool that I wanted to, uh, to develop had to be small, so nanotechnology came into play. I wanted something that would be very, uh, very non-invasive, biologically compatible, and something that wouldn't be disruptive to a brain as it is functioning throughout the course of a lifetime. Uh, it needs to be reversible. So many neurotransmitters, and the one I'll talk about today is dopamine, occur in the brain in spurts. So they, they occur in milliseconds, time and time again. So if you take the ice cream away, dopamine probably goes down, give it back to her, you know, probably goes back up. You need a tool that can track that. And I want you to pay, pay us, uh, close attention to these last two bullets. Uh, one, it needs to be tissue and bone penetrable. So the signal that I want to see, if I, can, if I want to see into my sister's brain, I can't right now because there's tissue, there's bone, there's a cranium, there's hair. Uh, so I wanted a tool that could go through all of that. And I also, even if I could see into her brain, uh, I wanted to be able to detect between different molecules, right? Dopamine being the key neurotransmitter, and the brain can distinguish as it's communicating with dopamine what is dopamine and what isn't. But chemically, it's actually very difficult to distinguish between dopamine and ascorbic acid and epinephrine, which have nothing to do with the same signaling pathways that dopamine is in charge of. So the tool that we developed is one that is based on a nanomaterial called a single wall carbon nanotube. Now, the semiconducting variety of these single wall carbon nanotubes, and they look something like this, um, emit in an infrared wavelength range. So what that means is that you can't see the light that is being emitted from this nanoparticle, but that light can be detected using fairly conventional uh, detectors. So we can take pictures of this infrared light, um, and we can do this in theory uh, in biological samples that are normally not transparent to visible wavelengths, which is what our eyes see. And so this is the spectrum of this uh, single wall carbon nanotube. Now, of course, that addresses the issue of tissue and bone penetrability, but it doesn't address the, uh, the issue of molecular selectivity. And so that's where amphiphilic uh, polymers come in. So our group developed a library of these amphiphilic polymers. These are polymers that have sticky ends. So these hydrophilic or these hydrophobic domains are shown in gray, and they'll stack onto the carbon nanotube surface. What this does is it creates a moiety that acts almost like a molecular bodyguard. So it can enable the detection of a specific analyte while excluding others that are competitors. And what happens then is that the molecule can enter this corona phase of this nanoparticle, and it can change the intensity or the wavelength of this invisible spectrum that can go through tissues and bones and cells, et cetera. And so essentially what you have here is a wavelength range where you can acquire pictures or movies over the course of an animal's lifetime that is selective for a molecular target such as dopamine. So the way practically that we do this in our lab is we make a library of these candidate, uh, candidate nanosensors, so we make many of these. We don't know initially which ones are going to be uh, good signaling molecules for our targets, and we also develop an analyte library. So 
uh, for example, if we wanted to detect dopamine, we would put dopamine in that library, and we would also include other molecules that we know exist in brain tissue that can compete with the detection of dopamine. And a successful sensor is one that not only provides a good signal, so an increase or decrease in intensity or a wavelength shift, but one that is also selective, so it only happens for one molecule in that library. And so this is an example of a successful screen. This was our first generation screen. Uh, we were looking at a fairly generic small molecule library, and what we found was that for a specific uh, carbon nanotube coronaphase, specifically uh, boronic acid phenoxydextran uh, copolymer, uh, this detects riboflavin really well. So this is vitamin B2, which is great. It showed that our assay had some uh, potential to work with more interesting or perhaps more uh, neurologically relevant molecules, and uh, it was a really good indicator that this was a, a good platform to move forward with. And so we did. Uh, the first thing that we did, uh, again, to show that this would work in a biological environment was we took a single cell, we put these nano uh, sensors into the cell, and so at time equals zero, again, this is a wavelength range that's invisible to you, so you can't see anything at time equals zero, you can't see the cell in this wavelength range, which is exactly what we want. And then we add riboflavin, and as time goes on, the cell uptakes riboflavin. And the reason you can see the riboflavin uptake over the course of an hour is, again, because these nanosensors are inside, and they're telling us that this molecule is present inside the cell. And we've repeated the screen for other libraries, so other molecular libraries that have other clinical re uh, relevance. So these are hormones, estradiol and thyroxine, uh, potential endocrine disruptors. Uh, we've done so for hydrogen peroxide, and we have a really great sensor actually for nitric oxide, which is uh, an indicator in inflammation, in early stage uh, inflammatory responses. And we have now also a nanosensor for dopamine, which is a very key neurotransmitter in many neurological diseases. So to give you a picture of how this actually responds, so again, this is, I'm going to show you a movie here. This movie is acquired entirely in the infrared, so you can't see it by eye, but you can see it with infrared sensitive cameras. And here we've immobilized nanosensors on the surface uh, of just an in vitro microfluidic chamber, and we're going to add dopamine. And as dopamine comes in, you can see that they all brighten up. And as I mentioned, reversibility being a very important component of this work, we also needed to go back down to a baseline condition when we remove the dopamine. So here we flush the chamber with uh, a PBS, just a standard buffer that has no dopamine. And we do this many times over, and we can monitor individual sensors. So these are uh, nanometer-sized particles, very small particles that are responding to dopamine. Um, and as you can see here, it's a pretty reversible sensor which shows very little hysteresis. So the, uh, the levels of dopamine and the intensity of the light correlate quite heavily on a 100 millisecond time scale, and those signals go back down to baseline. So where are we going with this? Well, I just mentioned that we have a sensor that in the presence of dopamine changes its intensity. Uh, its photostability, initially when we tested the photostability of these nanoparticles, uh, they showed to be extraordinarily photostable. So here what you're seeing is over the course of s about seven hours, there's no photo bleaching of these nanoparticles, which means that they maintain their intensity over the course of time for, for, for very long time periods. And this is not the case for most conventional fluorophore-based technologies, which tend to photo bleach, and that limits your experimental time window to about an hour at best. Uh, we've actually repeated this study and found them to be stable in mice for over the course of uh, two years now. So this is really uh, promising for, again, long-term studies. And they emit in a tissue transparency window. And a recent study in Hong Ji Dai's group over at Stanford showed that you can actually take these nanoparticles and through a tail vein injection, introduce them into the vasculature of a mouse. So what you're looking at here, especially in this far infrared window here, so you're looking at uh, these nanoparticles that have been infiltrated into the vasculature of the uh, of a mouse, and you're looking through the cranium. Uh, here, the, the most invasive part of this protocol, aside from the tail vein injection, of course, is that the, the mouse had to get a haircut. Um, but otherwise, you can distinguish individual uh, veins through the cranium of the mouse. And so, what we want to do in the future is, uh, in collaboration with Linda Wilbrich's group in psychology at UC Berkeley, is to comp combine two techniques. One is the dopamine uh, sensing capabilities uh, that we've developed over at MIT, and two is this two-photon microscopy, which is a microscopy technique that's actually very popular in physics, which is where I trained, but has only recently been applied to study uh, individual neurons in the brain. So this is a microscopy technique that can actually get in fairly deep through brain tissue. Um, here you're looking a few hundreds of microns in, and 
you'd be familiar with uh, an image like this. This is an image that, uh, that Amy showed. Um, and this is actually um, a cell, a brain cell that's being imaged inside a living mouse. So uh, we can track uh, the growth of these little buttons. So we can track the growth of, of the cell throughout the course of time. And we can do so for, for many weeks in a living mouse. Um, as it is exposed to different stimuli or perhaps for mice that are susceptible to certain uh, neurodegenerative conditions. And so what we want to do is take this a step further. So um, what uh, the Wilbur's lab has come to do is a stimulus as it relates to neural plasticity. So how does the cell change its shape uh, as, as, it's, uh, as the animal itself is being exposed to different stimuli? Um, but of course, the opposite side of that question is, well, what happens not only is how that cell uh, changing its shape, but what is it saying, right? That's chemical neurotransmission, which is where, uh, where these dopamine detectors could really become useful to bridge this link between stimulus and environment and chemical neurotransmission throughout the life course of an animal. And of course, accomplishing this would also allow us to bridge other links, such as the link between behavior and neuroplasticity and the link, the ever elusive link between neuroplasticity and chemical neurotransmission to really get at the fundamental question on a single molecule level of how do brain cells interact with each other and how is this different for patients with normal versus abnormal brain function. So with that, I would like to thank uh, especially my research advisor, Michael Strano, over at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and really the slew of people who have contributed to this work, both intellectually and in the lab. Uh, MIT has some very talented undergraduates which contributed to making these enormous libraries of polymers that we needed to screen to find the good ones for, uh, to be used as sensors. Um, and my future institution, UC Berkeley, and I would gladly uh, take any questions if there are any. Oh, yeah. We get Dr. Freeman first. <laughs> it uh, takes a real expert to make a scientific talk intelligible to the rest of us. Uh, and I'm going to put myself now into the general public for sure on this one. Um, and Marquita, you are the only uh, physical biochemist among us, or physical chemical <laughs> engineer among us. And so um, you've made this uh, not only intelligible, but it, it really was just like a PBS show, wasn't it? <laughs> and that, that actually, I think, is the best mark of an expert. Uh, someone who can tell you exactly what she's doing. Um, it's clear we have a genius on our hands. Um, I would like to say there was one other genius equally determined who almost ensured that she'd be here, and that was Connie Lieber. Uh, Connie, in setting up the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, put no boundaries on who should be part of it. As several speakers have said, we've talked about country, we've had an obstetrician, we now have a physicist. <laughs> and I think the one phrase, and this is what Connie envisioned, that by reaching out to young investigators when they started their career and uh, giving them the chance to start, she was also giving them the chance to address the problems of mental illness. And in her vision, this would pay off for years and years and years. And I think you've seen an example of the kind of innovation it brings to the study of mental illness. And uh, I suspect that having drunk the Kool-Aid, you'll be uh, in this field for a long period of time. I am going to stop calling it our field, because that suggests it's not everyone's field. And it is everyone's field. Um, and I think, as Michael Burke showed in his talk, there may be disproportionate funding, but we shouldn't have a disproportionate number of people working on this. this is. The, the brain is the frontier of science. It's the only frontier left for most of us. And um, to have people like you sitting at the frontier means we're going to push on forward. You have a marvelous technique. You would think after 60 years of prescribing antipsychotic drugs, which block dopamine, the psychiatrists and pharmaceutical uh, companies would know everything there is to know about blocking dopamine. But we don't. And 
uh, your marvelous technique is going to be uh, very informative as we look at what stress actually does, what drugs like the stimulants for ADHD, which release dopamine, actually do, what antidepressants, which block the degradation of dopamine through reuptake do, and finally, what the antipsychotics, which block dopamine, do. But I, I do have a question, or at least an observation. Um, it seems to me that uh, when someone as bright as you has gotten in the field, uh, there will be other people who come around and want to use the technique. But actually, you're probably in a better position than anyone else to design the next generation of experiments, which actually use this technique uh, to begin to discover things about the brain. And so you outline those in general, but uh, I always ask someone who's got a young investigator award, what's the first experiment you'd like to do? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I think when you have a tool like this, it's, it's a hammer and, and one of the perils is that everything can look like a nail. And it's really important to not be redundant with existing techniques that already work well. Uh, and it's important to be complementary to techniques that already exist and to access information that can't be accessed in any other way. And so that's really the direction that I want to focus this tool in is, and, and it seems like questions that are in the field of neuroscience, brain and behavior research, are really at the forefront of what can be addressed using a technique that can allow us to visualize what's happening in terms of chemical release uh, inside a tissue that's otherwise very inaccessible using uh, conventional, conventional techniques for uh, molecular recognition inside the brain. So I think this is a, a really great opportunity to see where this tool and how far it can go uh, to help our understanding of the brain. Yeah, That is a great question, and there, the field of nanotechnology is very broad. Molecular detection and sensing is, is one of the newer areas. Uh, nanodrugs, nanotechnology, that is focused on building molecules that have the capability of getting where other things can't get. That is a whole area of research right now as well, and it's also fairly new, so until it, it, it it gets validated for, for safety and reproducibility, um, those trials are probably going, are, I've seen a lot of those trials in, in the cellular phase, some in tissue phases, some in organism phases, um, and I think that's very promising, again, because of the way these, these nanomaterials are a nanometer uh, large and hundreds long. So that aspect ratio, if you can just imagine that, it's, it's almost like having a marble that would extend from here out to Central Park and back. That's the length to height ratio that I'm talking about when I say nanotube. So it's, 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 it's not surprising that those nanotubes can go places where other molecules can't that are more conventionally shaped. And that's a completely different area of work and one that eventually I would also like to, to get into if these, if these very preliminary data uh, eventually do have some sort of um, deep tissue penetrability. That's, that's why I'm here. This is, you know, this is why I, I, I really like taking part in the symposium. I think I've learned more today than I've learned 
in the entire past year about mental health research and ideas about how this could be useful in a, in a more uh, real life setting. Well, thank you. I cannot imagine a more exciting paper to close with. I mean, it, it just, we, I think we get a sense of peering into the future. And Martita, thank you so thank much. Thank you. It was real. <laughs>